Welcome to the RiskAdvisor.com podcast. I'm Sal LaFerri, and I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Jim Henry. Before we begin, I'd like to remind each of you to subscribe to the show and push the like button for us. Please leave your comments as your opinion is important to us, and we would love to hear from you. So today we're going to do series four in our Common Sense series, talking about, and we've, we've titled this particular segment is Damned If You Do and Damned If You Don't. And we want to talk about the role of the CEO, especially, and the issues that they're going to face in today's environment. What are some of those things? And I think to start it off, we're going to, you know, let's talk about the, how the risk profile continues to change. Jim, what do you think? Well, this slippery slope just continues to get slipperier. Hopefully after the election, regardless of which side wins, more common sense prevails. But I think that you got to prepare for if that does not happen. And we continue on this uh, crusade by some to defund the police and completely their term is reimagine security. Well, it's one thing to target, you know, areas of, in, you know, in any industry, and that includes law enforcement, you know, that can use, you know, improvement or discipline, you know, for those that, that disobey protocol. But this is well, well, well beyond that. We're seeing the consequences of the feeling of freedom for consequences by the lawless. And, I, you know, the, the challenge here is there's a political climate right now by corporations, particularly major corporations, you know, to be kind of going with the flow here, figuring that is the path of least resistance. And it probably is in the short term, but there's a big, 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 big difference between brick and mortar companies and tech companies. Brick and mortar companies have physical assets and people that they need to, that they're responsible to protect. As compared so, to a tech company. As compared to a tech company. You know, it's all virtual. Virtual. virtual it's all virtual. It's, yeah. You know, when, when this all first started back, I guess, really approaching a year ago, the movement of, you know, toward this defunding concept, which previous to this past year would be, you know, unthinkable by anybody on either side of the aisle. And now it just seems to have its own momentum. And, you know, like I say, that you just got to stop and scratch your head and say, you know, this is, this does not pass the, the litmus test of common sense. I think we're at a point now where you're right. We've gone so far on both, on both extremes that, you know, something radical needs to happen. And, and I know I had said this earlier on about having a, a terrorist attack to kind of wake everybody up, but You know, I think we've gotten to the point now where, especially with the defund the police and you look at the different, you know, risks that all of that is producing and they want to have community organizers and they want to have social workers deal with people running around with knives and violent family disputes and people with guns and, you know, don't have the cops around it. Hey, you know what? I, I am so frustrated by the whole situation I'm almost at the point of saying, go ahead, do it. Make the cops nothing more than Uber drivers. Let them drive the social workers around. And when the call comes in, let them take the social worker to the call. And then when they arrive, let them get out of the car. And the cops should just drop them off like Uber, drop them off and pull away. Because clearly what happens is you know, the, the presence of the police inflames the situation so drastically you know, you're just precipitating the violence, right? You're making it a necessity that it has to be violence. Okay, you want to do it? Drop them off. Make them an Uber car service. Get them to the scene quickly. You're in a marked police car. You got lights. You got sirens. You you know, whoop, whoop, the whole way through. Get there. Get them. You know, don't even bother stopping the car. Just open the door and let them duck and roll. Just get out <laughs> of the car. Go ahead. Go deal with it. And come back later on and then sit and then see what happens. Well, that may meet the political narrative for, you know, certain uh, mayors and certain demographics and what have you. But what about the business owners in, in those neighborhoods? You know, in the past, you know, your, your instructions for your local property managers or security directors was, listen, if you see something coming, reach out, call 911, call the authorities, you know, let them deal with it. Then when this all started, it was like, eh. Maybe we need to have, uh, if we're not going to get as quick a response, because they may not have the as many resources, 
maybe we need to look at private security, you know, to supplement them and whether they're armed or not armed. But then in a previous podcast, we talked about the legal ramifications, liabilities of that, because if something then does happen, they're not covered with the same indemnifications that public law enforcement is covered. Now we're looking at a situation where, you know, (laughs) whether or not they have the resources, they may have so many handcuffs on them for, you know, what their engagement is or elect not to show even if they have the resources because they don't want to inflame the situation, as you say. And now they're sending in effectively social workers into a very, very volatile environment where in no way, shape or form do they have the training or experience to handle that. And if you think that there's you know, a few incidences, you know, of, of improper conduct, you know, by the police. Oh, wait, do you, wait, do you see what happens? And then when you start sending in people that don't have that level of background and, you know, and training and caught in the middle are the CEOs and CISOs of, of corporate America. And it's just, hence the damned if you do and damned if you don't. So <laughs> we can say a million different ways, you know, what this slippery soap is leading to, we can all see it. I mean, the news is providing us example day after day after day, the reaction to anything, regardless of any kind of research into the details of exactly what happened in an incident, you know, the riots are happening the next day and they go on for days. And we have to recognize what this is going to cost in the long run. And really, you know, as we get into the solution, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself on the solution section, but this is not going in a good direction and it's going to be very painful even getting there, even if it doesn't end well. So I think, you know, everybody, everybody's got to take a step back, get the politics out of it. You know, we're politicizing the virus, we're politicizing unrest and what have you, and lost in all of this, which is the impetus for why we came up with this show of common sense of come on, you know, we have to apply some rational, logical common sense here. This, the, 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 we can't abandon corporate America, you know, to, uh, to street gangs. You mentioned the, the, you know, the cost, right? And you think about, so, with, you know, with the clients, the last couple of weeks, who have been spending an incredible amount of time going through the properties, looking at them, trying to figure out what the game plan is going to be, how if the riots break out, if it gets bad, how do you secure the facility? And in that planning process, you know, we've we've actually looked at something that would be very similar to what an embassy being taken over would be. How do you get the security people out of there? How do you secure them, get them to a safe room? How do you make sure your systems are shut down? What do you do with the elevators? You know, what do you do with the computer systems and in the, in the, in the, at the lobby desks? You know, how do you handle all of those issues? And we spent weeks in the planning. And then you start thinking about, okay, well, how do we need, you know, how, how do we provide security services for that? So you, you work with the security companies, you know, the guard companies that are providing security professionals at the desk. And you start thinking about, okay, well, normally on the overnight, I may have only one person. Now tonight, now I'm going to have two people on. Well, I'm going to have three people on, or I have other exits and ex- you know, all the vulnerable exit you know, locations within the property that are going to need to be covered because you may have people within the building. And, and the problems just start to compound themselves out and the cost just becomes exponential. And there's no getting that money back. You know, it's not run a sale and be able to, you know, to earn that money back. It's, it is a definite cost center. And I don't think, um, that's something that's actually being looked at hard enough. You know, I think the obviously the CEOs are going to get hit with it. You know, the, the, the CFOs are going to wind up seeing this. You know, when you when you start doing, you know, Q1 of next year, you're going to start looking at the looking at the numbers and you're going to go, man, we spent this much. It, it definitely has a cumulative effect. And it, and it is a it is <laughs> it's it is an issue that nobody that wants to address at this point. It, you know, it's the knee jerk, it's the knee jerk reaction, but with the, you know, the private versus the public security, right? I mean, we had touched about it before the issues that bring up between, you know, armed versus unarmed, you know, what do you do and what do you bring into the building? If you were to see, oh, how do you make, well, which way do you lean on that? Well, let's take it one more level. It's 
not private versus public. It's private versus public versus neither. Uh, you know, because in some cases, you know, you're, you're going to you're going to be left without e- without either one. You, you know, know, and I thought I was going to have to preface that and say to you, no, not what you would want to do, but what would you do? <laughs> none <laughs> of the you know, either. What do you do when you got none of the above? You know, I mean, you know, and, and because some companies may may elect to not have the risks of armed private security, so at the very least, they've got you know a skeleton, is you know basically a crew just for for first triage out there. But if, if they're not getting the backup of, of local law enforcement, then you really have no defense. And then you get into uh, then the, the logistical planning of, again, of, well, then what do we do? And maybe that's because there's so much to talk about here on the logistics. Maybe that's a good point to take a, take a break from, from, from this section and, and, and go into the logistics because I can't wait to get there. <laughs> <laughs> you are listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by myself, Jim Henry, and Sal Lafrary. We invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and to subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you are interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to have, consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. So, Logistics. I know. I thought we'd never get there. <laughs> so, what are your post orders then to your personnel? I mean, you've got a brick and mortar facility. You have assets to protect for the stockholders. You have your personnel to protect. And if your decision is going to be, we're not going to be confrontational, and we don't think we're going to get back up from law enforcement. You know, we're going to have a plan basically to retreat. Well, if retreating. At the very least, it's going to put your ass physical assets at risk, which then lends into, you know, rethinking putting those million dollar pieces of art in the lobby and, you know, what have you, <laughs> because that's not a good place for that. <laughs> but it also puts your employees and, and, and personnel at risk. And then that's another liability. So again, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Oh, it, it's true. You know, it, it, we've been, you know, again, in the planning stages the last couple of weeks, talking to clients and, you know, some of them have asked, well, can we put armed guards in the lobby? And I went, sure you could. And you, you know, in most cases, you're at a minimum doubling your costs from the, from the guard service to what you're going to pay for an armed guard, and especially in, in something like this and a high risk, you know, where, you, where they know that they're going to be getting themselves into the middle of trouble. And you put the armed guard in the lobby and, you know, can, would it be a good idea? It's a, yeah, you can pay for it. Again, it goes back to the cost that we were just talking about. Your costs are going to go up exponentially. And in reality, what are they going to do? You know, if 100 people are outside looting and they, they start banging on the windows and breaking the windows and get into your facility, what are you supposed to do? You know, three guys standing there with guns, are they going to start firing warning shots? You know, it goes back to what you brought up, the point of liability, right? You, right. How do you... You, you have to come up with a plan. You've got to be able to react to this, and you've got to be able to try and limit the amount of liabilities that you have. The irony of it all, and the thing that really bothers me the most about this, is that we're, we're writing plans today to be able to protect security. And that the irony of that is security is there to protect the building. Right. So we're, we're now giving up the building. You know, it just, if it really gets that bad, you can't leave two $17 an hour guards in the lobby of a billion dollar property and expect them to defend the property. You can pay those guys $100 an hour. They're not going to defend the property if 100 people come crashing through the door, right? What do you do? And the the social media communications between the anarchists and the ones that are just looking to foment unrest for the sake of unrest because it satisfies a a political narrative or something, you know, beyond the issue of, you know, whatever store that they're, you know, attacking. I mean, so far what we've seen, you know, is most of this has been aimed at smaller big box retail. It really hasn't had that much of an impact on the major corporations and corporate lobbies and what have you. And I guess, you know, one of the few positives of the of the limited, you know, on-premise employment you know, from COVID is that you don't have as many employees at risk. But, you know, as we get out of the out of COVID and you're going to have a lot more utilization of public transportation, you're going to have much more in the way of, you know, crowds on the street. 
and traffic into buildings, I fear that that's going to be another enriching target, you know, as you have greater and greater personnel. And then they're going to look for, you know, like terror, what do terrorists look for? They look for marquee sites to make a, to make a statement, right? Yeah. And yeah, then it really, you know, accentuates, you know, the exposure of damned if you do and damned if you don't, because then retreating, you know, you've got thousands of people in your building, you know, your employees that you're responsible for, plus visitors. And if you take any level of a stand to delay them, well, that's all well and good. If you know the police are going to be right behind you, you know, coming in once they know that they've got an altercation there. But man, if you can't count on that response coming in, either because of, like I say, uh, a lack of resources, you know, on the part of police or the apathetic reaction of the cops, they're just so they're, they're, they're fed up with being guilty till proven innocent on no matter what they do, even if it is just a, a fraction of a single percent of those that that are not, you know, following proper protocol. It impacts the morale of the of the whole department, and it's impacting the ability of them to hire good quality talent. So now you're going to lower the bar even further. And if you think you got problems, you know, within police departments now where you got a few bad apples, when you start hiring people with a much lesser level of credentials and background because they're so desperate for personnel, that's only going to get worse. You know, somebody came up with a statement a few weeks, it was a few weeks, months, whatever it was, that said that, you know, 27 is the new 20. That, you know, the level of maturity in the, in people, in the population, you know, it's the millennials or whatever. But a 27-year-old acts as a 20-year-old. And you think about it, you know, if, the, if, if all of that works on a sliding scale, a person who's 21 years old joins the police department. Yeah, you know, what are you dealing with, a 16-year-old? And, and you, you're giving them all of this authority and power, and you know, they're they're getting put into situations that just in normal circumstances, in a normal normal day to day operation, they want they find themselves in situations that you're just not really prepared for. You know, when I went on the job, I was 24 years old, and there were times when you know I'd walk into a family dispute, and the person that, you know, the, the, the cause of the family dispute was either a son or a daughter that wasn't too far away in age from me. And here I am supposedly trying to, you know, settle the dispute out. And, you know, you, you look at, and it kind of goes to what you were just saying, it, you, the level of person that you're going to get, you know, that I don't understand now with a lot of departments, they want you to have a college degree or at least an associate's degree. I, I don't understand where they're going to pick from that pool from. You know, if there's somebody who's going to is going to school and gets a college degree, I mean, do you really want to go into into a police force? Do you, do you want to deal with all of that? So they are going to at some point have to lower the standards to get there. And when you start lowering the standards and you get the younger age, yeah, that's a recipe for disaster. Plus, you're even losing you're even losing the group that could probably make more money in a different career path, but has some. Maybe there's a, a history, you know, in the family of people being in law enforcement for a few generations. They they understand that this is a, a good civic responsibility. They're actually doing something positive to protect the community. And, you know, they look at the at the degradation and the taunting and the ridicule and, you know, it has them do the double click rule on whether whether this is real. This is really something that go, should go to the third or fourth generation, you know, within the family. It's just, it is not, you know, it is not the kind of career path, you know, that it's looked like for the, for the past 100, 200 years. And, and what they're losing is not even just the 20-year veterans, right? What they're losing now is the ones with 10 years, 15 years on, guys, guys and girls who aren't even staying the 20 years. And you think about it, if you come on the job at 21, 22 years of age and you get in, you get in, you know, get on the job and you do 10 years, you're 31. You've had 10 years in the, in, in a law enforcement capacity with all of your training and everything else that you got behind you. You got 10 years of that experience, of that life experience. You're 31 years old. You can go to a company and work for another 20 years. Right? You can have, in essence, a, a whole nother career. If you were in and you were staying until, you know, late 40s, early 50s, you know, you're not starting a second career. So it's it, what's the problems that they're running into today in a lot of the departments is when as soon as they can vest out, they're going. 
And now you just got this humongous gap in between with between the new people coming in and those that are just kind of sticking around to get their 20 and hoping that nothing happens. It's, it's, a, it's a tough situation, but you know, that, that, that slightly takes us off the point of the problems that companies have, but. Oh, but it lays the, it lays the backdrop of the reality that they need to understand, you know, is, is out there. And, you know, you know, looking ahead into the third segment here, we talk about the solutions. What what can the CEOs do to address this? Because cash in, it, yes. <laughs> cash in and go. Yeah, they, you know, unless 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 they're just going to turn their businesses into a residential property and you know hightail it, you know, even you, residential you gotta, doesn't work. Yeah, these even days. residential doesn't work. These you days. you can't evict anymore. <laughs> you can't evict. Oh, this is crazy. Well. So I was anxious to get into the logistics section. I'm equally anxious to get into the solution section. So with that, I'll remind everybody you are listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and Sal Lavreri. We invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com. So subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you are interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. So the solutions, is there a good answer here? Well, in one word, no, (laughs) if we stay on the path that we're on. But not, you know, every, every black cloud has a silver lining. And the way I would look at it is what we're witnessing here is a wake up call to, to the CEOs that corporate America needs to look at this and recognize they can't be a catalyst to the direction that we are going. It is not in their best interest. But let me ask you this, as a former CEO of a company, of a public company, and we may have touched on this in an earlier show, they're sort of torn between what the board, what the, the board of the, you know, board of directors, their stockholders, right. That, that want them to, you know, that, that sort of mandate what they have to do. And in a lot of ways, and what we've seen is they've been forced to acquiesce to, in essence, extortion by a lot of these organizations right, that, are, that are basically shaking them down under, you know, under the guise of, you know, whatever program they're, they're pushing at the moment. But on the other side of it, you have to balance out the, the amount of liabilities that you have and that you're facing. And, you know, you brought up the point with you have employees that you have to be able to protect. You have an obligation and a, and a, and a responsibility there, right? And we're not even talking about OSHA and all the other stuff that, that applies. So how does one actually balance those I th- I think you can. I think you can you can recognize, you know, that there are look, look, there's issues in every walk of life, in every institution, in every company, no matter how good there's bad people, and no matter how bad there's good people. Same thing goes for law enforcement. You know, you're not gonna have one hundred percent. I mean, the problem right now is you know, if you have one tenth of one percent, you know, that are you know, that are misbehaving, you know, they're just, you know, we're, we're, we're highlighting that to a degree that's disproportionate to, to reality. And then trying to apply, a you know, a paint roller to the whole, you know, organization or just saying we have to defund and completely change everything. That does not make any logical sense. You have to, you know, I think you can be, I think co- corporate America can be, can actively support reform and improvement, you know, in law enforcement. But they have to stand firm on completely, you know, defunding police or, or, or saying that, it, that, that they're just not needed or just the presence of a uniformed uh, police officer is too incendiary and whatnot. You just can't accept that. You know, that, 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 then that's, going, that's just going too far. And all that's going to do is make the slippery slope even slipperier and make this worse. Well, that, that's been the problem, you know, for, for a period of time, for a number of, you know, in recent years, right? It's the selective enforcement of what laws they want to enforce, which ones they don't want to enforce. And, and it starts the ball rolling and it gets them, it gets you down into this, you know, into this arena. With respect to, you know, especially with the election and the potential violence that's coming up, you know, more so than anything else, locking the doors is just not enough. 
Right. You really need to. You really need to have a plan. You need to figure out what you're going to do. Well, when you talk about selective enforcement, you know, then then that variability, you know, is really what incites you know even more problems. So let's relate it to something. <laughs> A little more enjoyable, like baseball, right? Or where do you have the big fights in baseball? You know, it's when the umpire is not, you know, is not being consistent calling balls and strikes, right? <laughs> you know, and that's, you know, that's really what it comes down to. Have a very, have a very clear set of rules of engagement, have very, very thorough training with accountability, you know, to the, to law enforcement to be following those rules. You know, the police cameras, you know, the body cameras, which were originally a concern by the, you know, the police unions and whatnot, you know, which would be an invasion or hindering their ability to, you know, to do their jobs are now are now a law, a law officer's, you know, best friend. And yeah, it highlights, you know, the one tenth of one percent, you know, that are that are misbehaving. But, you know, it supports the ninety nine point nine 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 percent, you know, of those that are that are doing a good job. You know, it really requires, you know, going back to those, you know, fundamental basics and, you know, and recognizing that throwing the baby out with the bathwater here is not is not a good idea. But there and like I say, I think I think corporate America can can take the lead to be progressively for, you know, some reforms, but they have to be as vocal as well for, again, not going not going to the extreme and caving for some of the absolutely outlandish statements that I've heard made by some of completely, you know, just going back to square zero, eliminating, eliminating the entire department, starting from scratch. Yeah. And I, and I think that, you know, the problem is that they, they find themselves in a situation where if they did come out and vocalized about any of the, the planning processes and what they're anticipating and what they want to do, that they'd be chastised for it. You know, and I, and I think that's where you, they have to draw the line is to understand that they may come out and, I mean, look, everything you do today gets criticized, no matter what, right? It, it does, does not matter. It gets criticized. But they have to draw that line that says, I'm going to put a plan in place. I'm going to do some planning. And, you know, they'll, they'll get criticism over it. You know, but why do you think you need it? You don't need it. You know, you're, you're being racial by doing it. You know, you're profiling you, all of these things. And the reality is they need to have a plan in place because the liabilities that they're going to face in absence of it mm -hmm. is, is incredible. We thought early on that we would see an increase in, in lawsuits with COVID. We're starting to see that now with, you know, what did you know? And when did you know it? And what did you do? You know, some of the vaporware technology that was deployed is going to get challenged. You know, ultimately, they're going to be you know, put on the hot seat for it. And I think we get we get the same the same thing is going to happen now, where you're going to have a lack of planning for fear that it's going to seem like you're becoming a law enforcement agency or you know you're, you're trying to develop your own private force is going to wind up causing them to be liable for a lot of issues. Right. It's it's not fun. You know, on the other shows that we've done, we 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 generally have some you know fairly tangible either technological solutions or evolution of technological solutions that that are pretty good, you know, round peg into a round hole for a problem. This one, this is all cultural. This is, uh, you know, it's, it's, I say my, you know, I, I long for the purest background of when I, when I was, you know, getting my, my engineering degree and whatnot, and, you know, initially working in the security industry on the, on the technical side, you know, the law of physics is not subjective. It's very, it's very clear, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And you just adapt those, you know, to the problems that you have in the field. This one, this is just so much form over function, you know, with regards to how to deal with these problems. It, you know, it needs leadership. It needs leadership both on the public side with the elected officials and having half the elected officials out there basically staying mum to this, you know, or, or refusing to talk to it because they feel it might interfere with political agenda. And that's just, we have to be aligned. We have to be together on this. The, the elected officials, the law enforcement community and corporate America all need to be in sync to show a consensus and leadership to the rank and file. Otherwise, the rank and file is going to figure, okay, we're going to take matters into our own hands. Nobody, you know, you got you guys aren't aren't giving us a, a plan or a solution or a collaboration that we think makes sense. So we're just going to go and raise it up a notch. Yeah, I think the, you know, the 
All of that is true. And I think from the, you know, from, from a risk advisory perspective, corporations and corporate leadership is going to have to recognize that there are liabilities there that they're going to have to address. And, you know, it's the old pay me now, pay me later kind of thing. You know, it's, it's going to come. But in the end, right, you mentioned before, brick and mortar, there's no real solid policies. We look at COVID, we got closes, we got taxes are being increased. So really, what's so bad? Oh, that, that's, that's quite a picture, you know? That's quite a picture. You know, it's, well, as the Marines say, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And this is definitely a, uh, a test of that cliche, you know? You know, I'm reminded by when, it, when I first got into a detective squad, there was a, there was a situation where there was like over 300 shots were fired. This running gun battle that went over like a quarter of a mile, half a mile. It was just this long, big case that went on. And it was a senior detective that had gotten it. And it had happened just before I got there. And so I get to the, get to the squad and I'm talking to him one night, we're having a cup of coffee. And I said to him, so let me ask you, when you get something like that, where do you start? And he looked at me dead in the eye and he said, where do you start? I said, kid, your first thought should be, how do I end this? Right. <laughs> he said, you don't want to, where do you start? How do I put an end to this? Right. And that's where we are today. That's, that, a, that's a very good perspective. Yeah. How, do, how do we put an end to this? But you know what? It starts with consensus from all those stakeholders that I just mentioned saying that we do need to end it. Because if you can't get, it's one thing about how to end it, but if you can't get consensus from elected officials and law enforcement and corporate America that it's got to end, you'll never get the negotiation and compromise on the logistics, you know, to improve the situation. It's true. All right. We're going to, we're going to end this at this right here. So you've been listening to the Risk Advisor podcast ho- hosted by Jim Henry and May Sal LaFerri. We're going to ask you to subscribe to the show and like us on our social media sites like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We're going to remind you and ask you if you're interested in having one or both of us at an upcoming event, either virtually or in person, or would like to consult with us, please go to the webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. Remember, you can hear the show on your favorite podcast platform, YouTube, and of course, stream it at theriskadvisor.com. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you tune in next week.